Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today is a special episode of Splat from the Past because I'm going to be interviewing Mandroid himself from the 1986 Charlie Band produced sci-fi classic Eliminators, Patrick Reynolds. Yes, Patrick Reynolds in a rare podcast interview, a man who grew up in, an, in a pro-smoking environment, and now he's an anti-smoking uh, person. And I'm going to have him on the podcast today to talk about how that happened and why Eliminators was the only movie he did where he was the lead in and all the uh, uncredited small parts he did back in the 70s, and it's going to be pretty cool. I can't wait. Like I said, it's a rare interview. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Patrick Reynolds. And this is Patrick Reynolds. Hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. It's such an honor, and I thank you for your time today. So, going back to the beginning, um, you grew up with a grandfather by the name of R.J. Reynolds, who uh, founded uh, Camel and Winston Cigarettes, um, but was acting something that you wanted to do early on? Uh, Kind of, yeah. When I was five, I wanted to be Pope. (laughs) But the next year, by the time I was six, I had the little girlfriend, and I wanted to marry her instead, so I knew I couldn't do both. But I always liked uh, the limelight. I, I, I don't know, played the Archangel, Archangel Gabriel in the Christmas pageant. And I had this deep, deep, booming voice. And everyone saw this little blonde guy about nine years old get up and say, Fear not, for I bring tidings of joy. And they all thought <laughs> it was very funny. And I didn't know why they were laughing. Uh, but uh, later I did school plays. And, you know, I think I played the... A, a dead man in our town, and I, by the time I was in sixth grade, I, I started in uh, a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, no, seventh grade, and who, who does Gilbert and Sullivan operettas, you know, in the seventh grade, but there I was, singing, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, as Sir Joseph, uh, I am the monarch of the sea, the, world, the, world, the queen's maybe in seventh grade, eighth grade, I played Coco in the Mikado. I've got a little list. I've got a little list. So that stuff stays with you, you know, if you do it when you're a kid. And after that, you know, plays in high school, and then I came out to L.A., and I thought, nah. I, and my brother gave me a camera, and I became the president of the photography club uh, in eighth grade, and then again in twelfth grade. And then uh, and I went to a fancy prep school in New England. It's kind of like Harvard, except it's a high school. And it's called Hotchkiss, Hotchkiss.org. And they sent most of the kids to the Ivy Leagues. Not me. I went to Berkeley, 1967. And, huh. uh, you know, I, I was in a couple of plays with Hotchkiss, but uh, I was more interested in photography by then. And in Berkeley, when I got out there in 1967, uh, you know, I had been in a coat and tie boarding school, you know, in New England, seven days a week. At some point, we were in coat and tie. And it was all boys, and there I am in the age of free love in Berkeley. <laughs> and, uh, you know, within about six months, I had long hair. I had tried, uh, you know, uh, pot and whatever else there was to try. <laughs> and I never got into repeat uh, experiments. It was usually a, you know, a few times. But uh, I didn't like the effect it had on me, so I, I quit. Uh, you know, by the time I was like 21 or 20. Mm-hmm. So from 18 to 20, it was a period of being a hippie in Berkeley. And, and uh, you know, I made a documentary of Berkeley. My brother gave me a big camera. And I, mm-hmm. I just thought that was so cool. And I wanted to be a filmmaker. And my, one of my teachers was the director of the San Francisco Film Festival. His name was Albert Johnson. He was an African-American. And I had never seen... Uh, an African-American guy with a PhD. 
And I, you know, it, it changed a lot for me. You know, my friendship with Albert, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he knew I had a little family money and he said, come on, I'm invited to the Cannes Film Festival. I got to pick out all the films for San Francisco. Why don't you come to Cannes with me? And there we had dinner with Andy Warhol and, you know, there were people like that at the table. You know, Dennis Hopper was at the table, small dinners for six or eight people. And I was exposed to, you know, quite an interesting uh, uh, gang of characters, you know, through Albert. I met Clint Eastwood, mm -hmm. Eddie Davis. Uh, Clint Eastwood looked at me and he said, it's nice to meet you. And Betty Davis, I, I was in my full hippie regalia with no underwear on and a pair of torn <laughs> blue jeans and I got down on my haunches and I didn't know my balls were hanging out through the bottom of the, my pants and Betty <laughs> Davis was looking at me with bug eyes and uh, I was saying, well, Miss Davis, you know, my mother was under contract to Warner Brothers, you know, do, do, you, do you wanna, you know, do you remember her? She was there at the same time as you. I don't believe I do, cool. <laughs> she was looking at my balls with bug eyes. I didn't know. I had long hair and I was later on the way out, she passed by and she kind of brushed against me and she said, I hope I see you again. <laughs> and she left. It was at Mike Nichols' studio, Zero Trip. And then, uh, you know, so I had some adventures. You know, and Albert and Khan, uh, you know, fell in love with an Indian uh, actress named Asha Putli. Mm -hmm. and I had a white tuxedo and white pants and long blonde hair, and we were. She had dark brown skin and she and jewels in her forehead. I mean, we we stopped off, made a few cars slow down, and one time Albert took me to. Uh, so we look after Khan. I'm going to the, the film festival in Moscow, except they're having it down in Tashkent this year. Why don't you come down there? And Tashkent is like north of India. So I said, sure, I'll go. You know, I paid my fare and paid my hotel room and went with Albert and uh, again met you know some fascinating people uh, in the movie world. So you know, uh, I guess that my big uh, you know uh, failing as an actor, well, mm -hmm. not an actor, but my big failing as a filmmaker was that I had family money and I didn't have to join the Hollywood community. I didn't have to get a job. I didn't have to. Uh, gosh, uh, you know, join everybody because uh, I didn't need the money. So I made small short films on my own. Uh, I made a documentary of Berkeley. I made a documentary of my, well, that was back in college, documentary. Of, and I dropped out because at that time uh, I became a devotee of Anne Rand, who wrote The Fountainhead at Atlas mm -hmm. Road. And my God, you know, that. Her books, you know, blew me away, and I bought into everything she was saying. You know, and I became an arch conservative in liberal <laughs> uh, left coast Berkeley in the '60s, in the late '60s. And there is, uh, uh, you know, me arguing against uh, the anarchists. I said, you know, man is good, and he should have a free society. He doesn't need a big government. Well, in the years that followed. Uh, hiding big tobacco, my family heritage, after my father died from smoking. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when I became an adult, this is how I realized what I realized I really wanted to do in my real calling. Uh, after my, you know, I, I, I was looking at how the Republicans have stopped taxing tobacco uh, and stopped any regulation of tobacco and how they were taking a lot of money from big tobacco. And I began to think, this is really corrupt. You know, every time you raise the tobacco tax, the kids start smoking. Uh, and, you know, we need to tax it. Uh, Secondhand smoke kills. Big tobacco lied. They said they never thought it was addictive. And secondhand smoke wasn't really dangerous. I mean, they mm -hmm. went in the face of all the science. And they lied under oath. And I realized, you know what? Man does need regulation. Man, absolutely, and corporations need oversight by the government. So you know what? I'm not a conservative. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'm a liberal, and I became a Democrat, and uh, understood that you know there are limits on the amount of freedom that you can give uh, individuals and corporations because left to their own devices, they will just line their pockets and at the expense of public health. And mm -hmm. that's what I learned. So.
that's just how I crossed over to be a Democrat. And but back wow. in, uh, I had an interesting life. And that's you know, in the I met the, and one night in a nightclub when I moved down to L.A. to pursue my filmmaking career mm-hmm. and enroll at uh, film school at UCLA and later at USC. I met a girl at a nightclub while I was uh, at UCLA. Mm-hmm. Shelley Duvall. Oh. Shelley was starring for Robert Altman in The Shining. And I, I kind of rattling on to, I guess you have specific questions, but I'm, I'm and then telling you my life story, and do you want me to continue doing that, or do you want oh. me to stop and I'll, I'll ask do whatever you like? You, you've been doing good, but uh, I'll, I'll ask questions, though. <laughs> all right, all right. It's okay, it's okay. According to um, IMDb, throughout the 70s and 80s, you did many uncredited uh, roles in movies like... Um, Nashville, Buffalo Bill, Hair, Airplane, Xanadu, and so forth. Were these roles uncredited because of um, you weren't in the SAG yet? Uh, no, I think I was in SAG at the time, but, you know, it was just, uh, they were all roles that were too small uh, to be credited. Uh, you know, one by one, on the Airplane, I did have a role, I still get royalties on it from Paramount, uh, little ones, but... Uh, I was supposed to be one of the Harry Krishnas, and I didn't want, I had long hair, and I didn't want to shave my hair, uh-huh. so they just gave me a, a, a day role, a one-day a one player. I was, I was supposed to be a guy that took a punch at the airport. I didn't take the punch well, and I never trained or took a stunt class, so the, uh, the stuntman stood in and did my part, and you can catch a glimpse of me, uh, this very pretty hippie, you know, with long hair, in the background, in the opening airport scene where they're going toward the plane, and they punched out the stuntman. That was supposed to be my part. <laughs> and also the Eric Christian, but, you know, I turned it down. I shouldn't have turned it down, you know. And other roles, like, uh, for her, I was a friend of uh, Beverly D'Angelo. Mm-hmm. Beverly was a lot of fun. She did National Lampoons, Animal House, and, I mean, uh, Vacation, brother. Yeah. And Beverly said, look, I'm in, uh, you know, I'm in uh, the movie uh, Something About Monkeys or whatever, and with Clint Eastwood, why she coming to the set? I was in L.A. and I drove to the set, and there's Clint Eastwood with her in the trailer, and we just so there. He didn't remember me from the San Francisco festival, but the same voice, the same soft-spoken tone, as though he were saying, uh, you know, he didn't want. I'm not a, a giant. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm really a nice guy. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> so nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> uh, so. That was, it was soft handling. It was softer than what you would think Cletus would do. So he, he, you know, anyway, whatever. But that, that, that was the, after the next question, I'm sorry. I think about my past <laughs> and my life and I get excited and start battling on. It's okay. It's okay. I was uh, reading, you know, you went, you went and you trained in all these great places like the Strasburg Institute and Peggy Fury and Milton Caselis and so forth. You were in classes with a lot of um, uh, famous actors and stuff like uh, Jeff Goldblum, Michelle Pfeiffer, Patrick Swayze. Did any of these people indicate that they would go on to, to uh, huge success in the industry? Well, we all thought that they would. Well, at least we knew that Patrick and Michelle, Patrick Swayze and Michelle Pfeiffer, would probably make it in the business because they had done Broadway shows, and we all knew that if you're a struggling young actor around L.A. and you haven't done Broadway, you know, uh, you know, the acting teachers are basically tricking you off. I mean, you know, to you know, use a vulgar expression, they, uh, uh, you know, say, oh, yeah, you could do roles like this or that, and they name big stars. But most of the kids, even though they were equally talented as Patrick and Michelle, had not done Broadway. So mm-hmm. they couldn't even get, they couldn't get arrested. They couldn't get a card. They couldn't get a SAG card, some of them. And they were brilliant. I mean, I sat and watched scenes, you know, produced uh, on that little workshop stage. And what it tells me is that the business is very tough to break into. Yeah. And if you want to be a star, you've got to do stage and important roles in stage, not just workshops. you got to do paid Broadway and off-Broadway shows to make it and get an agent and get the respect of the agents in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So you did a lot of uh, theater in the years um, leading up to Eliminators? Uh, I, I did a lot of training. Uh, it was really hard. I, I don't think that I was naturally
actually uh, talented as an actor as a young man. I was too self-conscious, and above all, I didn't really have the self-esteem. You know, I got it now, but but back in those days, I was young, and I had never had therapy. I hadn't had two years of a drink looking at me and saying, uh, mm -hmm. well, Patrick, that was really wise what you said. You're a caring person when I said something caring. I mean, that woman, Irene Casola, who wrote some books, Casola with a K, uh, she was a genius, and my greatest teacher in my life, uh, even above all the acting teachers and voice coaches and whatever you did, I had money and I was going to, I could have four or five teachers at the same time, so I worked my butt off, you know, to train, but uh, and one day I met a girl and, and uh, she said, you know, you should see my mother, you know, she's a famous psychologist, I said, there's nothing wrong with my mind, and she said, no, go see her, she's great. So, not being any particular crisis, I went, and mm -hmm. it was that's the best time to go to therapy when you're not in a crisis. Because if you go when you're in a crisis, all you can work on is the uh, all you can work on is the crisis, the divorce or the death in the family or whatever. But when you go with no crisis, you start working on the the deeper stuff like your childhood and how your parents treated you. And when I speak at universities, and I do a lot of that, and I do some middle schools and high schools, I love it, uh, I always say to the adults, I tell the audiences, look, if you haven't been in therapy, you know, you're, you're not fully educated. Mm -hmm. you know, if you haven't looked at your childhood and you haven't uh, talked to a psychologist and gotten clarity about how your parents' treatment of you when you were little affects you now as an adult and affects almost every choice you make for a mate, for uh, in work, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, it's very, very powerful to get clarity about your childhood. And that's what I did in therapy. And I also got my self-esteem built up. So, But at the time, uh, back in those days, uh, why didn't I make it more as an actor? It was terrifying to go on an interview. I mean, you could sit across the table from four people that look, look like, you know, they're in the Gestapo, and they're looking at you and saying, so, who are you, Patrick? <laughs> and they got lights on you, and it's, it's very, very uh, scary to go on acting interviews. And I was nervous a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, now it just wouldn't be the same, but... In, in those days, that's probably why. You know, you have to have a lot of self-esteem, which means probably a healthy childhood. I would bet you a dollar that Brad Pitt had a really healthy childhood. And Marilyn Monroe didn't, but she had mentors, and she had, you know, she built into the role. She had Strasburg. When I took the master class with Lee Strasburg himself, he used to say, you know, he could see that I was nervous, probably. And he said to me, Patrick, you have a quality or something. I want you to do that to the salesman, but improvise. Don't memorize the lines. Just improvise. And mm -hmm. that was very, very... So he could build somebody that needed to be built. And I think Marilyn Monroe certainly studied under him and probably how she got her confidence. Nice, nice. So how did you get so lucky into playing Mandroid in Eliminators? Oh, my God. <laughs> well... <laughs> It was an unexpected, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, gift that I got. I dropped acting. I was out of acting. I said, no more of this bullshit. And then I, uh, you know, had moved on. I, I, and I've been on so many interviews and uh, I got little roles and, you know, supporting roles and this and that. I worked so hard, but it wasn't happening. And in 1983, I got married to a German girl, my first wife, Ruth Jane, we're good friends today, and mm -hmm. we really are, and because God, we shared so many adventures with the jet set in the 80s, and the 300 foot yachts, and the private jets, and all of that, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, where was I going with this a acting, can you help me out, uh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. quit acting. I went to work for her father. He was uh, in the bus business. He had, a, he, owned, he had a company that owned 300 or 600 tour buses. And uh, I went to work and toured Europe and went to all the bus factories in 
started learning the business uh, through my father. And I'd never had a father, never had a dad who paid attention to me, who, you know, who would mentor me in business. And it felt great. And it was so right. And my own dad was an alcoholic and uh, I married four times. And after he divorced my mother in a bitter divorce in 1952, and I was three years old, uh, he moved on and married his third wife who tried to murder him. And then he divorced her and he married his fourth wife and left the fourth wife all of his money. So I couldn't get a lot of money from my father. And he, to add insult to injury, he disinherited all his children. So, you know, I had to work. I mean, I had some family money, but not enough to where I wouldn't have to work. It was, it was a good thing in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. Now that I'm older, I wish, you know, the money was still coming, but it's not. <laughs> you got to move on. But uh, anyways, where were we? Ask me some more questions. I've, oh. It's been an interesting life. It's all in detail in my book, uh, The Guild of Leaf. There's a good 40 pages about my life, which we certainly has a lot more detail than what we're talking about today. <laughs> but the G-I-L-P-E-D, Leaf. And it's about three generations of my family. And I've long wanted to produce, even before we even started writing it, I produced it with the intention of selling it to television because I knew that the Reynolds family story was fantastic. And uh, I zeroed in on the uh, 1920s and 30s as really the era for season one and two. And if you go to season three, the 50s, okay, fine, 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it's a rich story and uh, uh, needs to be told. And it's, it's right on messages. I mean, it's just an entertaining story of decadent rich people that are, uh, you know, uh, meaning well, but failing totally as parents. I mean, my, my father did anyway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my mother got me to great schools, gave me a great education. And uh, but anyway, now I had a father. I was married to the German girl, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we had just put our little toes into you know uh, hobnobbing with the chess set. And uh, there was a billionaire named uh, Turnin Texas, who's well known in, in Germany and in Europe. He died suddenly. He was actually uh, he knew my mother back in the day, but um, and he he said Patrick. Yeah, he read about it in the newspaper that the tobacco king is marrying the German student in the brood. And uh, the, my, my father-in-law, wait, wait turn in Texas, called me, and I knew him socially. He said, Patrick, why didn't you invite me to the wedding? And I said, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, we didn't feel we knew you well enough. We were trying to be diplomatic, but we were laughing about it. Because that book calls and says, I want to come to your wedding. He says, well, I'm coming. So he came. And Robin Williams came. And the best man was one of my best friends, uh, mm-hmm. Mohammed Khashoggi, who was the son of the arms dealer Khashoggi. He was right to him for $2 billion in, in the divorce, half his net worth at that time. And we all, that was a lot of money, so he made a lot of headlines. And Khashoggi lived the life with the 300-foot yacht and the, you know, private planes and the 35 homes and all that. And as Mohammed's best friend, I was invited everywhere. And we had a ball. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there was a, um, I get, you know, sort of trailed off into forgetting what I was trying to say. Yeah. About the- so I, I quit acting at that time. Mm-hmm. I said, no more of this nonsense. I got a a father now. He's teaching me the best business. But as fate would have it, and as a long answer to your question, how did eliminators happen? My agent called and said, look, Patrick, do you remember those people who you screen tested for a year? I said, no, I don't. Uh, Because there was a lot of interviews. And she said, well, they want to see you for a play. I said, what is it? She said, it's a leading role in a science fiction movie. And you're going to play a robot. I said, a robot? I said, what, can they see my face? <laughs> he said, well, no, the upper right corner of your face will be metal with a red eye, uh, but the three quarters of your face they're going to be able to see. I said, okay, I'll go in the interview. But now for once in my life, not having had, now I've had therapy, I've had, you know, been around the world with the chef's head and hung out on them, you know, and the, everywhere from London to Paris to South of France to, you know, 
around the world with some very fascinating and pretty fabulous people, uh, nice people, um, for the most part. Uh, and I got a little confidence, and I go in the interview, and for once I'm not desperate for a role mm -hmm. and nervous. And uh, I said, you know, I'd like to part. I'd, I'd be good in this. You know, mm -hmm. right after that, the phone rang, and, uh, and I went on the interview, and I got the part. And they said, yep, we're going to start filming in three months. So immediately they had me going down for fittings and costumes. You know, I had to be, my whole body had to get molded in the, with clay and fiberglass. And <laughs> that, was a, that was a tickle. And, uh, uh, but it felt so great, you know, and I, I, was, I was very conflicted because I was really down on the industry. I said, I hate the business. I don't want to go back to acting class. Now I have to go back to acting class, practice memorizing lines, and delivering them the way I've been trained over the years, and and this is what I've got to do. Mm -hmm. And I went back to acting class, back to Casillas again, and Casillas I thought the best one, although the others gave me such you know power as an actor and yeah. and training. And um, I'm going to tell you the, the Charles Conrad method because that is quite fascinating. But and I can do it in a minute, but. Back to, you know, and then they kept losing the money for the budget. I, I don't know if they thought that I was going to finance it because everyone thought I was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And nobody knew that my father had disinherited all his sons. And I didn't have that kind of, I had a couple million in the bank, but the income from that was like, what, $80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And with Shelly, I could live in a five-bedroom castle on top of Shelly Duvall, who starred in The Shining and uh, who starred in... Uh, Oh my God, she she starred in um, uh, Popeye as Olive Oil and other movies. She was in the the entourage of Robert Altman, the great director, and Altman found her, and she never would take acting lessons. After me, she dated Paul Simon. She was a mm -hmm. fabulous human being, is an amazing woman, uh, and uh, sadly is uh, not doing as well these days as living in Texas. Yeah. Uh, mentally ill and talking about aliens and I hope she's better now. Uh, Dr. Phil had her on a show. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, so that's a whole story. But that's how I started acting. I mean, Deborah Shelley said, come to the set of Nashville. And I said, I'm not coming to the set of Nashville. <laughs> and it was 1975. And I said, I'm a filmmaker. Not going to happen. And she said, oh, please, please, I miss you. I want to see you and please come. So... I finally agreed to go, and Shelley goes all around the set of Nashville, talking to Jeff Goldblum, and uh, that's where I met Jeff Goldblum for the first time. Mm. And Lily Tomlin, and Julie Christie, and everybody in the movie. Um, and so my boyfriend's coming, and he's kind of shy, and he's not, you know, he doesn't feel like he's going to fit in. He doesn't, didn't want to come, so be real nice to him, okay? So now I go to the set of Nashville, and all these movie stars are going, Patrick, darling, how are you? And there in, in her trailer, she was standing by my side, is walking around topless in the trailer. <laughs> and I went, this is Julie topless in front of me in the trailer. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, an adventure. And all of them even said, Patrick, would you like to be in the movie? And I said, well, uh, you want me in the movie? And I said, but I'm a behind the camera guy. And I hated all the films, by the way, at the time, because I was still <laughs> locked into my conservative views that we should never have, uh, we need heroes in movie, and Altman's movies didn't have any heroes. They had anti-heroes, mm -hmm. or flawed characters, which was very in vogue with the critics. But in my uh, universe, uh, we needed, you know, John Galt from the Atlas Shrugged, and we needed Howard Rock, the architect from the Fountainhead, and, you know, Billy Jack, you know, character. Yeah. Like that. So, so that's how I started acting, and Altman basically gave me uh, some glorified extra work in Nashville to keep me around. And I never got into a discussion about uh, disliking his films, because I knew to keep my mouth shut, but I did talk to Alan Rudolph about my views mm -hmm. and the line. And since then, I've mellowed out. I mean, I, I really see the value of Altman's work. He was great, and his films were wonderful. And people are flawed, and they are victimized by their environment, despite what Anne Rand you know, says with her ideology. So uh, the point is, 
to, you know, I started liking Roman films. And that's how I started acting, so sorry to get that out of order. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. What Was it heavy to wear all that armor in the Eliminators? A little bit. I mean, if I'd fallen off, you know, the scenes where I'd fall off the back of the boat, I would have sunk like a rock. Uh, they put flotation devices in my backpack. Uh... And then within one scene, I had to fall in the sink down because the camera's shooting straight down. It had, you had to see me fading down in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was no budget. They just put a rope around me and hauled me up the rope. <laughs> and then one scene when I, I uh, was on the raft and put my heels in the water, uh, you know, the first day we filmed that, we had to re- reshoot it because the, you could see the cables coming out of the water. Mm-hmm. Speedboat. Uh, the raft kept nosing underwater, and I was sitting on the edge of the raft with no flotation uh, device this time in my backpack. And if I'd fallen off the freaking raft, I would have uh, sunk like a rock, and I'd, I'd be dead, you know. Yeah. So, so, and I said, Bessie, Bessie, you know, who's the first AD. It's the job of the AD to see about stuff like that. And her job is to make the movie and get it filmed and tell people to move their butts and you know, get, get in front of the camera. It, it, it's the good cop, bad cop school, where the bad cop is the first AD, and people don't like her because they're always, she's always pushing, pushing, do it faster. We don't have to, we can cut corners, it's okay, get the shot. And the, the good cop is the director, everyone loves the director. So now it's a, Betsy, I don't have any flotation device in my backpack, please. We're behind, we're behind the schedule, just do the shot. So I almost fell off the raft because it's going, the nose of it is going underwater, mm-hmm. being towed uh, by a speedboat off camera to, you know, get the speed going. And it was scary as hell. I was terrified. So anyway, mm-hmm. that, stuff like that was going on. And, and uh, but all in all, uh, it was an adventure. Uh, it was hot. It was Spain, like, it was just like Florida in the summertime. Yeah. On occasion, fiberglass. And... I said, beg Peter, Peter, please let me take off my legs, you know, because I've got the master shot with the, the need the full body. And, yeah. uh, you know, and he said, no, and he would relent. He was finally, he was pretty humanely concerned. And, you know, the crap of things so that went to me, got me from the waist up, and I could cool myself down a little bit. It was hot, and they would throw them barrels over me in the sun. Uh, they would take off my robot arm and then pour out, like, uh, literally a pint of sweat would come out. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it was, it, was a, it was a tough shit. I mean, making movies is no picnic, especially low-budget movies. I think in some of the later Terminator movies, uh, Arnold probably had an air conditioning uh, thing that hooked up to the robot suit and, you know, got him to, you know, just cool down. I, we didn't have that. We were in the sun a lot of the time. <laughs> Yeah, when I was interviewing uh, Danny Bilson a few months ago, he told me the concept of the movie, and I agreed with him. I've always thought of this. The concept of the movie was Star Wars and Indiana Jones combined. You know, I mean, when I was growing up, this movie was on every video store shelf. It's always been one of my favorites. Um, how how was it working? About, about that, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I actually, uh, when Eliminators was released in 1986, uh, well, I think it was 1986. I went to the con. We had filmed, I don't know what happened. I went to the con film festival. Yes, it was the year Eliminators got released, 1989. I went to the con film festival, and I made a point of meeting with uh, the CBS Fox studio because I heard that they were going to release Eliminators. Mm-hmm. And I really liked me. And I said, you know, and I, I, I always thought that maybe because... I had, you know, hobnob with them a little bit at the Cannes Festival, but they decided to make the Eliminators the pick of the month for their releases. That meant having cardboard cutouts of Mandroid in every video store, and I think I've got one somewhere, and I've got the posters, and, uh, you know, it meant, it meant um, having a special release for Eliminators, and it, I, I like to think it was probably because I met with them at Cannes. Yeah. What was it like working with Andrew Prine and um, Denise Crosby? It was great. I mean, you know, I mean, 
honestly, uh, they're, they're awesome. Andrew is totally professional. He knew his marks. He knew his lines. He was wonderful in the role. Denise was up and coming. She is the love child of Ben Crosby, and I, yeah. as you know, allegedly an heir to the R.J. Reynolds' fortune, uh, I think that, that we were cast, Denise and I were kind of cast as a pair of heirs. And, um, you know, it, it really uh, uh, didn't do the movie any harm. Denise was great on the part. She nailed the character. And, and I, I just hold her in high regard. And afterwards, we were both interviewed for Star Trek Next Generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they got down to three actors for the role of uh, Captain Picard. And I was one of them. And when Patrick Stewart, you know, uh, he was one of them, uh, he had done Shakespeare. I had only done Eliminators and a few movies before that. Mm -hmm. And he was more the older, you know, he was the stronger uh, choice for the role. But I got so close to having major roles uh, like that. Uh, and they always get down to two or three people and someone else got it. So it's a heartbreaking business. I mean, you get so built up and you're, you're like on top. And, you know, it, it can turn you into a, a manic depressive. I imagine some people might. <laughs> go over that cliff, <laughs> but not me. I mean, but it was sad and heartbreaking. And I remember, you know, pounding on the walls of the mansion that I was living in. I bought this 12,000 square foot mansion in Bel Air, mm -hmm. pounding on the walls, feeling sorry for myself. How come my acting career isn't going better? Luckily, I was in therapy and I went to see my therapist. And I, and I said to my friend, uh, that I love tell the story to people that have depression. I said to my shrink, uh, you know, Irene, my acting career isn't going well. I, I'm so depressed. And she's looking at me, and she knows me, and she looked at me, and she said, and I expected tea and sympathy. I understand, dear. No, she didn't say that. She said, you want to be an actor? She said, move your ass. She said, you get up at 10 o'clock in the morning, you date starlets, you, you, you party <laughs> at night with the jet set, and you're out in Beverly Hills in restaurants and clubs. She said, you want to be an actor? Work harder. And as she had trained me to say, <clears throat> I said to her, school you, Irene. You know, she talked, she had those folks come out of my mouth. She gave me a script. She said, I want you to tell me, screw you. You know, <laughs> without me. 
and she was right to talk to me that way. And uh, I, you know, I never thought of suicide again. Not that I would, would ever have done it. But you know, in therapy, you can say any little thought that crosses your mind. So, so, uh, uh, and I was never depressed again. No more depression. It never came back. And that's was done without pills, without any word, without anything but words. And that's what psychologists do. So, you know, uh, she she got me, and she she I got you know balanced again, as it were. So, I have a perspective on the movie business. I love it. It's the highest, greatest art form that mankind has ever devised. It combines all the other arts. It combines writing from paintings, narrative from novels, music from music. Uh, it combines all the arts, and because it's such a complex art form and so hard to get all the elements and you know the, the combination of the arts just right, that's why nine out of ten movies lose money. So. Uh, is moving in a golden age, and I don't know how movies like Black Panther and some of the great films of our time uh, get made. It's like yeah. there's some kind of alignment of the stars because such great things are being done now in this time we live in. Have you ever seen seen anything like it? And I don't know if this really will again uh, if we go into the decline. But uh, we're living in a golden age for movies and for the arts. Oh yes, absolutely. I was I would have sued her for malpractice after that. <laughs> no, I mean wrong. I, I, it works. Her intention was to get me to not be depressed. It worked. Mm -hmm. I would have sued her. She she healed me. <laughs> I know. With with all that training uh, in acting you did though, I have to say you really brought the humanity to Mandroid, and you do a good performance in the movie. You know, uh, my mother uh, died unexpectedly five days before the start of shooting. But there I am, back in my house, trying to get, I got it on the market. I was renting out my house on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And um, I had divorced my wife that year. I quit smoking. Uh, we made, all 1985. It was a terrible, wonderful year. Uh, but terrible because there I am, separated from my wife. We only married with two years, but um, you know we were kids. And we hung out with the fast crowd. The Jets said Robin Williams was running around with us, and I don't know who else. Uh, and mm -hmm. I just, you know, the, the, the my mother died five days before the start of shooting, and the kid was shocked. I wasn't expecting it. You know, her maid called and said. She was in a condo in a high rise in South Beach, before South Beach and South Beach. And she said, Mr. Reynolds, your mother is on the floor and she's not breathing. And I said, Oh my God. So I, I made the arrangements. I hired two more secretaries. Uh, I got packed. I got the, I flew to New York a couple of days early. We had the funeral services. I, I buried her at the cemetery in New York. And I, from that limo from the cemetery to JFK, I got on a plane from Madrid to go make eliminators. And I had no time to grieve. I had no time to uh, feel sad. You know, when your parent dies, you remember all the things they do for you when you're little. Yeah. And it, it comes flooding. A host of memories come flooding back. And every time some little thing, and a Stevie Wonder song came on the radio when I was driving the day after she died. And... I just called to say I love you, and I just oh. had to pull over, and I was bawling my eyes out. The Jews have a smart thing they do. Uh, they sit in a chair and little group bereaved friends, and they rock from their waist forward, back and forth with a shiva. It's called a shiva, and they let that grief go through their bodies and permeate them, uh, because if you just dust it under the carpet, it stays with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, can stay with you for years. I carried grief for years about my father uh, not being there. And only in therapy was I able to bring that grief up. Irene Casola said to me in her early session, well, was your father there for you? I said, no, he wasn't. And she said, how sad. How sad, Patrick. And I began to get in touch with this ocean of grief that had been in my stomach for years and it started coming up and going to men's retreats uh, you know when I had a man standing behind me as all of us did the, half the men on the 
circle is seated. We're told where baby is just born, and but standing behind you is a man who is your father, and he will welcome his newborn son into this world. And that man has got his arm around me, and he's whispering in my ear, Welcome to the world, Patrick. You're my boy. I love you. You're my son. Oh. And you just start to cry, and the tears come. And the more you can get the grief up and let the, the tears out, uh, the, the, the more you feel. And I went on that retreat five times, and the first three times, all my eyes out in that moment of the retreat. We did the same exercise. And the whole time, I'm t- I didn't cry. I had no tears, and I was going, yeah, I got my dad there, he was kind of grooving out on it, and, you know, he's, I'm his baby, and this is cool. I went back. I couldn't believe I had, and maybe I had worked the grief out of my body. But life takes work, and these days I'm real big on two things. One is called the Mankind Project, and out there is, the website is mankindproject.org, and what they do is they, they're a worldwide group uh, who offers a weekend called the New Warrior Training Weekend, NWTA Weekend. And they do a training uh, that goes very deep. And there are some rituals, and uh, nudity is optional, you know, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, but, there's, but you can do it at some point in the retreat. And we dance around the campfire, and it's, it's an incredible experience because it is all about being a man, masculinity, recovering lost masculinity in the age of assertive women, and they train you how to get into a men's group that can last for decades. And I'm in two of the men's groups here around LA. There's a thousand thriving men's groups all around the world right now uh, that the Mankind Project, and they're self-led, so nobody's getting paid. No mm-hmm. purpose there. We are self-trained, self-led, and some of the men take it on themselves to become get more training as facilitators, and they can help the other guys in the men's group uh, resolve conflicts. We resolve conflicts, the groups stay together. And one of the co-founders of the Mankind Project has now started a new thing where women are welcome, and it's called Time for Tribe, timefortribe.com. And mm-hmm. that, that I, I would like to, I hope I can find some billionaire to put 50 or $100 million into just advertising timefortribe.com because we all need to be in small circles of friendship but we need training as to how to resolve conflicts when they arise and they will and so that the friends can stay together as a small community people today are so isolated and we don't have deep friendships and we don't have you know a, a real community of, of loving friends around us as we get older we get more and more isolated a lot of us especially men and so the, the Mankind Project, and time, which is mankindproject.org, and then Time for Tribe are two antidotes to that and great solutions for it, but they're little known. And uh, even though Mankind Project is now on four or five continents and spreading around the world. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, so after the movie came out, what, what triggered you to completely leave acting and go into anti-smoking advocacy? Well, I think it, it probably came down to a moment when I was on like CBS this morning or I think it was Maria Shriver who was meant to do the interview, but she picked off and she uh, gave it to a co-host on the Today Show or Good Morning America, I don't remember, uh, it might have been CBS, but uh I had spoken out publicly in Congress about tobacco. And it was the same year Eliminators came out. So Eliminators came out in January, mm-hmm. came and went. Uh, you know, it made its money back, but it didn't really, like, it was no kind of blockbuster. Uh, yeah. They didn't do any market research. And I said, Peter, you probably, I think you should call the, the movie Mandroid because it would probably get more audience. But no, no, he had an ideology about uh ensemble productions and he wanted to be an ensemble director the way that Robert Altman was or you know Steven Spielberg or whoever mm-hmm. and it's all about the group so he called it Eliminators and I thought it might have done more business if they called it Mandroid because it made it more, it was more science fictiony. but anyway uh, the movie came and went uh, none of us became big stars we were all disappointed mm-hmm. and then I, someone in Washington found out that I was anti 
thing, and I had views that tobacco taxes should be higher. I've been on a tour of the Capitol with a very wealthy uh, Republican donor buddy of mine. His fiance couldn't go, so he called me and said, do you want to come take a place and go on this tour? I've got nowhere to go with And I said, are you kidding? Yeah, sure. I'll come on. So I got on a plane, I went to Washington. There I met Graham and Redman and all these, you know, John McCain and, you know, uh, when Robert Packwood came in the room, mm-hmm. uh, I said, how come tobacco taxes are so low? And because they were, the, the federal tax was 16 cents. And that week it was going to go back to 8 cents a pack. And now it's like a dollar. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Obama and the Democrats. Uh, the Republicans would not do it for eight years under Bush. We tried and tried. Anyway, the Democrats spent it. They know, and, and 3 million lives have been saved because of it. The Democrats' tobacco tax. Uh, you know, it's, it's pragmatic. And the choice Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes. They just have an ideology against taxes, and it's pure stupidity when it comes to tobacco. So, moving on, uh, it became clear to certain people in Washington that I thought tobacco taxes should be higher. You know, uh, uh, Senator Packwood looked at me and said, Patrick, you're Reynolds, and you want to raise tobacco taxes? You're from the R.J. Reynolds family? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, we had a hearing uh, uh, this week. Why do you testify publicly uh, that you think tobacco taxes should be higher? Because the tobacco tax is actually going to go back down to 8 cents from 16 cents. And I said, I'm sorry, but I, I need to talk to my family before I you know, do that. Uh, but it intrigued me, and it it, it, it put in my mind that maybe uh, uh, I could make a difference on this issue. So I began to learn more about the tobacco the show. I didn't know much about it. didn't really pay much attention to it. Uh, I had begun writing the book about my family, The Gilded Leaf, with Tom Sackman, who I was packaged with him by William Morris Agency. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a long and winding road to get, to get an agent. It was nearly impossible. But I made them believe in the project, and um, then, uh, uh, you know, I, when I did testify publicly, uh, and I was after it got around Washington, I was invited to go testifying at another congressional hearing. Mm-hmm. It got in, it got uh, around. Excuse me. It was my testimony was covered by the national media. And there I am on the NBC Nightly News and all the big major news broadcasts. And they used two sound bites from my t- testimony before Congress. Uh, with the hand, and I shouted it because I thought that would be dramatic and effective. And <laughs> I said, it was the hand that once fed me is the tobacco industry, and that same hand has killed millions of people, and it's time for people to wake up about the dangers of smoking. That made the news. And then the other soundbite that uh, made it was a little softer. And I said, uh, my only memories of my father, R.J. Wells Jr., are of a man dying from smoking. And I remember him cough, coughing and grasp, gasping for breath. She took my father away from me. And that's why I'm here today. So those are, you know, we had a lot of media training uh, for you know, interviews with the reporters. And that was my first adventure in media training. And that soundbite became my most powerful defense. So there I am, you know, uh, having been trained a little bit, but still nervous about being on the big morning shows. And they look at me and they say, Come on, Mr. Reynolds, you're an actor. You know, you're doing this for publicity. That was, that's how it felt. And they probably said it nicer. But those were the words that they said. Yeah. And I said, you know, my only memories are of my father dying from smoking. I care about this issue. It killed my dad. And that, that shut him up. But that was the sound that became out of media training. Because when you go, you know, like when we did this media training for my book, The Go to Leave, you know, we knew the first question they're going to ask is, why did you write the book? Yeah. And uh, we had to develop an answer for that that would make people want to buy books. That's what media trainers do. So 
this answer, I said, uh, we, you know, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going, blah, 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 you know, uh, without, in, in, in the little workshop we did privately before going in front of camp, news cameras, and I, I, we used the same, I said, we said, you know, I had a lot of anger toward my father because he wasn't there for me, and I didn't know him very well. So I wanted to get to know my dad, and that's why I wrote the book about the family. So it tells people watching, oh, anger, this is going to be a juicy read. The meeting, the meeting that I did, uh, Little Brown, or the publisher, reported the single greatest day of sales uh, resulting from a single talk show by an author. So when I did Hurrah de Rivera, you know, I used all those sound bites in, in our 12 city book tour that they sent me on. And we did, you know, uh, some of the morning shows, and I don't remember, Larry King, and I don't know who else. And it really, uh, uh, we sold a lot of books. And it really comes through the opportunity that an author has to say the right things that will pique the public interest in buying and reading the book. So that's how we did it. And the media training for the tobacco work, I was trained by media trainers on many political campaigns I worked on uh, and delivered those lines like a pro. And I've even thought of running for Congress and um, probably should. But, you know, I've had such a uh, colorful life, so to speak, from being a hippie to running around with the chess set that I thought, nah, I better not run for Congress. So, uh, <laughs> although it's always tempting, and I did start a political action committee, a super PAC, to elect Democrats, and I did that in September. Uh, funded it my, out of my own shallow pockets, now shallow pockets. Uh, I think I spent $15,000, and we put up, we, I filmed, I, I did a casting session, and I didn't want to be in it myself. I, I did one or two of the, you know, commercials myself. Uh, but I like the actor that I cast a lot better than me. Because he, you would, you would buy Ice in the Winter from that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the website is congressmajority.org. I couldn't attract, I, I attracted under $500 in donations. I went to see George Soros, uh, well, I contacted him through his political people, and I know Soros and have had lunch with him at his house. Uh, I've talked to, I have access, I mean, I've used the access I have because of my name to, to reach people. And a lot of the big donors to Hillary's campaign, I looked them up and made contact, told them who I was, I'm doing this. I, I, I contacted Michael Bloomberg, and I think some of them may, may have copied my ideas because my concept was uh, we need a pack that says, doesn't get behind any candidate. Uh, it just says, vote Democrat, and here's why. Uh, and that, you know, there was a couple of big uh, packs that basically took that concept and ran with it. And I, I had gone to a lot of the big funders of those packs, so they bypassed me, or they had the idea on their own, I'll never know. But I'm glad that they did it, and uh, I have ideas for more commercials, and I hope that I can attract some funding, because the ones I want to do now uh, involve multiple actors, and uh, they're much more complex to film than a talking head, which is what we did for congressmajority.org. And the new, the new ads say something like, um, you know, oh, these people they don't want to work, it's those white Republican voters. <laughs> and it cuts to a black guy that says, and he's homeless, and he's miserable, and he says, I just want a job. And it cuts to, you know, we shouldn't be giving money. These social programs don't work. Cut to, uh, now he's better dressed, and he's doing better, and he says, I got a job thanks to the Accept Better program.
Yeah, my mom, she spoke 35 years, and I and everyone who knows her never thought that she was ever going to quit, and she's been off cigarettes 13 years now, and I'm so proud of her. Who, who are you talking about? My mom. Oh, I thought you said your mom. I didn't hear you. Wow. That is awesome. Awesome, awesome. How long has she been uh, off of cigarettes? Th- 13 years. Wow. Fantastic. Well, I wrote some quitting tips. I was a smoker from age 18 to, not to make it about me, but <laughs> congratulations to your mom. Uh, what I like to say to smokers is, first of all, most of them quit and fail several times. And the first thing I put on our quitting tips, when I wrote them at our website, tobaccofree.org, which will be launched soon in a whole overhauled version, tobaccofree.org, uh, and we're going to become the foundation for a tobacco-free world now. We're going much more international. Um, and we have $10,000 a month in free advertising on Google because we got a Google grant. Nice. Uh, and the first thing I put in the quitting tips when I wrote this, you can do it. If you've tried to quit smoking before and failed, put comfort in the fact that most smokers do fail several times. Don't give up. You can do it. That's why they don't try, because every time they fail, they they you know, lower self-esteem. I failed 11 times, so first-hand experience. Second thing, now we go into 12 steps. You know, admit that you have an addiction. This is the second thing that I wrote. And the third thing, get into a program. Irene, my old teacher, Irene Casola, said the winners get help. And for therapy, for uh, in business, for business women, get a you know, for, uh, a marketing company to do the advertising, uh, a doctor when they're sick, a lawyer to write their contracts. People who win get help. And I teach that to high school kids when I speak at high school because, you know, in quitting smoking, it's no different. You get into a program. Mm-hmm. 95% of the people who do it without a program go back to smoking within one year. Those are the statistics. And with the program and the best programs we have, nicotine replacement, the Zyban, the gum, the patch, whatever, um, Xantix, I believe the statistic is that 85% still fail. But yeah. if you look at people within a year, they go back. So if you look at the glass of water as being half full, you see that the, the, the success rate goes from 5% with no program to 15% with the best programs we have. So your chances of success triple. So get in a program and get help. And I go into the boilerplate points about the most important one being the deep breathing. You take a big, deep breath of air, and if you're listening out there, take a big, deep breath of air with me right now. Two, two lungfuls of air. And exhale slowly and let all the air out slowly and let your chin go over on your chest and just let all the tension leave your fingers and toes and relax. And do it again and again and again. And by the time you've done that three or four times, you will not want a cigarette. Uh, it's also a great thing to do before an acting interview. <laughs> <Just relax. laughs> well, one last thing I wanted to ask you. Um, because uh, because Eliminators has a little bit of a cult success, has anyone ever um, asked you to uh, sign autographs at conventions? Uh, you know, I haven't. Go- I-, I wanted to go to a convention uh, here in LA when they ran a screening of Eliminators, and I was trying to go, but I had a lecture to give, and you know, people were paying me four thousand bucks to go speak because I got to be a good speaker actually over the years, and my acting abilities helped that out. Uh, probably a lot. Uh, when you speak, you've got to deliver your anger. You've got to deliver your feelings, just like in acting. And you've got to, you know, be passionate about what you're speaking about. And I can do that. And uh, you might have heard today a little bit. Um, so I had a four thousand dollar gig to go speak, and I needed the money for my family. I've got a wife and a nine year old son, and uh, we've been married ten years. And uh, I just feel so blessed every day. So we are. Seventy years old. Uh, I am, uh, you know, still holding my own. I read a book called Younger Next Year, and highly recommend that book. It will motivate you to exercise, and if you do that, you won't get cancer or diabetes or heart disease the way people who don't 
exercise do. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's it. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for having me on today. I, I've given you everything I got. Well, Patrick, I'm heavy on the convention circuit. Um, I can suggest you and hopefully that somebody will book you, you know. <laughs> well, I would love that. I would get the biggest kick out of it. Uh, I would love to come speak or, you know, uh, <laughs> so many things I could speak about. Uh, you know, do you want to go and be an actor? And do you want to, you know, be in the movie business? And what's that really all about? And, you know, I tend to try to dissuade people from it because I'm doing them a favor. But the ones that really, really, really still want to do it, knowing the odds, are the real McCoy, and they should pursue their dreams. Mm -hmm. Well, Patrick, you are very much blessed and very, uh, very inspiring, I have to say. And I just thank you so much for coming on today. And uh, this, this, this was just, I can't tell you how, ama how amazing this was. You've lived quite a life. <laughs> I mean, sure, I could have gone to Congress. Maybe I could have been more, you know, if my dad had been around. But I, I think I had a pretty good life, and I'm contributing as best I can. We all want to leave the world a better place. And yes. I can't, of everything I've talked about, I still think uh, timefortribe.com is probably the most important uh, thing of all. Okay, what's it called again? Timefortribe.com. Timefortribe.com. Patrick, you have yourself a great day. All the best. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Patrick Reynolds. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Patrick. You've had an amazing and inspiring life, and you'll continue to do so. God bless you and your wife and your child. That's just amazing. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!